Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us this morning uh, and for Mother's Day weekend. So shout out to all the moms and grandmas out there that have endless patience and love and dedication to their uh, children and, and grandkids. And also, uh, happy uh, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. My name is Kasha, and I'll be your host for our virtual program, Artist Talk with Melissa, um, sorry, Artist Talk with Navajo Weaver, Melissa Cody. And before we begin, I'd like to share our um, land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this event is taking place throughout the unceded territory and traditional lands of the Tongva, Batavian, Serrano, Kitsch, and Chumash. We honor and pay respects to their elders and descendants, past, present, and emerging. This acknowledgement demonstrates our responsibility to lift the stories and cultures of the original inhabitants of LA County as they continue their stewardship of these lands and waters. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on their traditional lands. And as the American Indian Resource Center librarian, I would like to invite you to visit our webpage. You can find books, media, resources, and our upcoming events, which we do have quite a, a bit planned for um, the next few weeks. I am also inviting you to a virtual program, uh, Trailblazers in Conversation with P.S. de Spain, who uh, will be sharing her experience as a native chef. And um, being the season one winner of the cooking um, competition, Next Level Chef. So we're excited about that. And now we can um, share more about our wonderful speakers and press the background. It's like insane. So I'm excited. Um, Melissa S. Cody is an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation and a fourth generation Navajo weaver. She has a bachelor's degree and museum studies from the Institute of American Indian um, Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, her style is often um, linked with the Germantown uh, revival. It's a movement named after the government wool from Germantown, Pennsylvania that was supplied to the Navajo during the time of Long Walk. Melissa's work carries that balance of tradition, history, and contemporaneity forward. Working on a traditional Navajo loom, Melissa recombines traditional patterns into sophisticated geometric overlays and haptic color schemes. Melissa's work has been featured in many museums and galleries, such as the Stark uh, Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts Institute of American Indian, uh, Ingram Chapman Gallery uh, with the University of New Mexico, the Navajo Nation Museum site, the Mass Gallery, the Heard Museum, um, the Exploratorium, the Museum of Northern Arizona, um, Rebecca Camacho Presents, the National Gallery of Canada, and the uh, Minneapolis Institutes of Art. So that's an insane amount of institutions and uh, cultural and um, organizations that she has her work um, featured at. So um, that's amazing. <laughs> and with that, I turn the mic over to uh, Melissa. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for having me today. I'm really happy to be here to um, not only share my story and present my work, but just give a greater insight into you know the weaving process and some background history of Navajo textiles and um, go a little bit in depth about um, my weaving um, history within my family, but also you know the generational um, wealth of knowledge that I've kind of harvested over the last 40 years of my life. But um, I am Navajo from the northern part of Arizona, but on the southwestern corner of the Navajo Reservation. Um, I'm full Navajo. Um, and the community that I'm from is, um, again, on the southwest corner of the Western Agency. Um, of the Navajo Reservation near Flagstaff, Arizona. So um, the Navajo tribe were a matrilineal culture. And when we um, you know, encounter new friends, new people, new acquaintances, we usually give an introduction, uh, which includes our four clans, which are all, uh, all the mothers um, of my parents and my grandparents and my grandparents. So I want to go ahead and introduce myself in the traditional way. That way, um, if anybody has any relations to me, it's usually nice to know, you know, where we fall into um, place with one another in the world. So I'll go ahead and start off with that. Yeah, 
she Melissa Cody in a shia, top of her nishling, hush garden to her bushes chain, sit now Jenny Dasha Che, door knock I didn't add Dasha Nale. Um, hello everyone. Um, I'm Melissa Cody. I come from the Edgewater people as well as the Yucca Fruit Strung Out in a Lion Clan people, the Black Streak in the Wood Clan, and also the Mexican People Clan. Um, currently, I reside in Long Beach, California. I've been here since probably the end of 2013. Um, so close to 10 years I've been here in Long Beach and had a brief stint in, in downtown LA. But um, currently, I live here in Long Beach. Um, my my large weaving studios here in Long Beach as well. But I do go back to Northern Arizona to my community uh, about two to three times a year to not only visit my family, but to also, um, you know, frequent the different art shows and art markets that happen there um, in Arizona. Um, Hi, Melissa. Gonna, I'm yes. so sorry. Um, I'm not sure if you um, wanted to have your video on. It looks like it's it's dark. It's dark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me see. How is that now? Yes, looks great. Thank you. Okay. And my screen share is on? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. So um, again, I'm from the southwestern corner of Navajo Reservation. Um, I grew up weaving in Arizona. I learned how to weave when I was five years old. So the, the weaving history within my family goes back about five generations. So my, my mother's great, great um, grandmother was a weaver. And from there, a lot of the weavers within our family learned how to weave by watching and actually, you know, taking part in raising the sheep and herding sheep, um, cleaning the wool and doing the entire process by hand. Um, I actually learned a little bit different, which was my mother actually sat me down and gave me formal instruction on how to do the technical weaving process at the loom first before actually handling the raw materials and creating the threads and setting up the loom. So when I learned how to weave, um, I was five years old and I grew up on the reservation and I had two sisters and an older brother as well, who also learned how to weave. So it was very, very um, evident, you know, in the household that we saw weaving looms, you know, in our living rooms. And then we also were able to, um, you know, see weaving at my relatives' houses. So my mom and my dad come from very large families. Um, one has 13 siblings and the other has 15. So within that family, they're it's mostly women. So I had a lot of aunts and cousins who were weavers, you know, alongside my family and siblings and my mother. So I was able to again have the weaving evident, you know, in pretty much all facets of my life, whether I was at home, whether I was at a relative's house traveling, or whether I was at school. Um, you know, I was giving demonstrations alongside my mother when I was a child. So it was something that was always encompassing my life, um, even, you know, as a, it, even in grade school, preschool, kindergarten. So um, as far as, you know, the weaving culture within my family, my mom's mother, Martha Gorman Schultz, she's pretty much the matriarch of my family after her mother passed away, Mary Clay. Mary Clay was my great grandmother and she was weaving up well into her nineties. And she actually had to have the doctor um, um, recommend that she actually stop weaving because of her dwindling eyesight and, you know, the straining of her eyes with sitting at the loom. She, um, they, they thought she would fare be better if she um, toned it down with the weaving. So um, in her 90s, she finally decide, decided to make that transition. Um, my grandmother, Martha Gorman Schultz, um, she's in her late 80s at the moment and she's still at the loom. Um, so she, she still weaves. Let me 
show you. So in this next slide, you can see a photograph of the Navajo reservation. And that white island in the middle of the reservation is the Hopi reservation. And to the lower left of that, you'll see a small community called Loop. So that's where my family um, is from that area, just east of Flagstaff. So in the community of Loop, it's very, very small. There's one boarding school, which my parents and all of my siblings and myself went to um, growing up. And then there's um, what's called a public school. So it's part of the school district that's um, located in Flagstaff, which is off the reservation and not run by the BIA, which is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So again, being, being um, raised um, in a border town area, I was able to, you know, have the life of living on the reservation, but also being able to go into town, into Flagstaff and experience, you know, um, more of a urban setting. And then also being able to travel down to Phoenix and, you know, visit the museums and um, have different experiences that the city held throughout, you know, my childhood, I was able to experience a lot more. Um, being on the southwestern corner of the reservation, you'll see that um, we, we didn't have a huge heavy influence from the trading posts. Um, if you look more to the eastern side and the central part of the reservation, you'll see a lot of names that coincide with um, Navajo regional patterns. Navajo regional designs. And those designs came out of the different trading post area areas um, and were influenced by the traders who at different times um, brought, brought um, catalogs and brought images of Asian rugs, Persian rugs. And a lot of those images influenced um, the Navajo styles from those areas. So as the railroad came through, a lot of those different design works became signature styles of those areas. So you'll see like Two Gray Hills, Ganado, Crystal, East Nazbans. Um, those are all considered signature traditional patternings of Navajo weavings. So where I'm from in the Southwestern corner, we didn't have that heavy influence. So my family, um, we did pretty much every design work that we, you know, that, that suited our individual tastes. Um, in our area, you'll also see a lot of a pattern called storm pattern, which mimics um, design work of lightning, different elements of nature in terms of the thunderstorm, water bugs, things like that. So, if you take a look at the photo to the left here, um, when you think of Navajo weaving, I'm sure a lot of individuals will have this type of, you know, very primitive Navajo vertical loom come to mind with, you know, the weaver outside and weaving in the desert landscape, which is, you know, how my grandmothers and um, my mom grew up weaving was out in the elements and, and out in nature. Um, working these, you know, very muted colors, colors that came, you know, from the landscape. And in, in our area, in the southwestern corner um, of the reservation, there's, it's very desolate in terms of vegetation. So you, if you look at the pattern of the rug that's on this loom, you know, you have a lot of cream colors, black, white, and gray, the natural colors of the sheep but there isn't much vegetation to get any um, variances in terms of pastel colors. So um, it's very muted and very, um, a lot of browns and yellows and, and toned down greens. If you look at the photo to the right, that's the current loom that I'm um, working on. So I've been working in a style called Germantown. And if you 
if you look at the color palette, it looks very eclectic. It looks very, very bright and bold. It looks, um, you know, like something that's very contemporary and almost digital in nature. And a lot of that, you know, is stemming from the basic materials that I'm working with, which is called Germantown plied yarn. So the name Germantown comes from Germantown, Pennsylvania. And it's actually called a revival style because it's reviving the use of this Germantown wool, which was introduced to the Navajo um, during their imprisonment at Bosque Redondo after their forced removal from our traditional homelands in 1864 by Kit Carson and the United States government, the United States Army. Um, it was a forced march where a lot of our you know, Navajo people perished um just getting to our prison or the prison camp and then you know a lot of our people were also lost there um uh, while captured you know due to just you know deplorable living situations starvation um lack of general resources which contributed to illnesses introduction of new illnesses that we didn't have any um you know immun immunity to so during that time, it was a very, very dark um, era. And we were imprisoned in Bosque Redondo, which is in Eastern New Mexico for four years. So during that time, um, Kit Carson and the armies had pretty much wiped out all of the sheep flocks. And that was an attempt to um, pretty much decimate, you know, the people to wipe out our people if, you know, if they were able to, um, if they were able to destroy our food source, you know, that also meant that, you know, we would disappear along with the, the sheep. But during that era, they were um, supplied with a minimal amount of rations. And in those rations were, um, you know, commodities like, you know, blankets. And those blankets were made of wool that had been milled in Germantown, Pennsylvania. So when the Navajo um, received those blankets, what they did was they unraveled them and then they would reweave them into their own styles and designs. And since everybody, since the Navajo people, you know, we, we span over three states in our traditional homelands, since there was, there were weavers from all different corners of the reservation, um, there was a lot of influence and a lot of um, flow of create you know, there was still creative energy going on within the weavers where they were exchanging designs, they were exchanging ideas of creative process and ideas of um, how to create composition. So and during that time, a very popular type of weaving that came out was the sampler. So the sampler is more of a free form where it's collaging a lot of different um, design elements from <clears throat> traditional patterning into one piece. So you'll see that they a lot of times lack that mirrored four quadrant um, quality that you'll see in other Navajo works where, you know, there's a very, very prominent midline of symmetry going vertically as well as horizontally. And so the work that I do, um, you know, you'll, you'll rarely see all four quadrants be um, symmetrical. I do have like, a, a very um, eclectic style where I like to create a lot of three dimensionality into the work and making um, a foreground, middle ground, and background within the two dimensional plane of the textile. So I, I view the weaving as my canvas and try to integrate, you know, the weaver, not only you know myself as the weaver, my perspective of the the digital work. But also um, bringing into the piece, you know, how is the viewer going to experience the textile? How are they going to be, you know, um, um, experiencing the work, you know, from the perspective of, of um, not only the viewer, but being able to decipher the pattern or be able to put themselves into the work and um, travel throughout the designs um, that are woven. So even though 
I work on this very large loom. It's exactly the same setup as you'll see in the picture to the left. It works the same way um, with the rectangular frame. Um, it's all held together by tension. And you'll see on the left, it's a rope at the top and to the right. Um, on my current loom, I'm using the very, very heavy duty um, ratchet straps. So there's, there's a very, very, very high level of tension that the loom is um, holding. So everything that um, I've done to engineer the loom is very, very precise. So it all works cohesively. And throughout my weaving career, it's my father and my brother who are the, um, the makers of my looms. And they're union carpenters based out of Northern Arizona. So um, I, I take great pride in showing their work. And um, you know, without them, um, my, you know, my work isn't possible. So the piece to the right with the pink background is seven and a half feet tall by four and a half feet wide. And this is at my studio and I have two other looms that are similar in size and have similar works on them. Um, if you look at this piece, um, I sit on the front platform where those dyed sheepskins are. That's the plane that I work from. And I sit cross-legged just like the woman to the left. And as the weaving builds higher and higher, it actually folds down below my, um, where I'm sitting and it folds to the back. So the bright pink you see in the back is actually the completed parts. And I started on that very um, top edge. And it's still done with the same heddle system as the weaving to the left. Everything is hand manipulated. Um, there's no shuttle. There's no beater bar. Um, the way that I compact all my strings is by uh, a handheld comb, which I tap down and the tapping compresses each individual string um, one by one. So, it, it, you know, it's a long process. This, te this particular textile takes about six months. Um, I've had them take, you know, all the way up to a year, but it just depends on the complexity of the pattern. Um, and then also, you know, my drive to finish and then also, you know, my work schedule, how busy am I? And if I'm dividing my time between multiple pieces, you know, they'll take a little bit longer than if I'm just devoting um, a full work schedule to one piece. Um, so if you, again, take a look at the text, my, my textile to the right, I have about two feet of exposed vertical white string of warp. So that's the, that's the space that I have to complete. And with Navajo weaving, it's called a continuous warp system. So the warp starts on the very left-hand side and it runs in a figure eight all the way to the right-hand side. Um, just one second, hold on. Okay. Yeah, so it's a continuous warp, warping system. And when I'm setting it up, the size is predetermined. So unlike a Spanish um, like big box floor loom, um, I can't just cut it off whenever I feel like I'm finished with it. I actually weave all the way to the top of um, the ends of the warp strings because that's where the, the textile will be released once I'm completed. So the further up I move, the space I'm weaving in gets smaller and smaller, and so do my tools. So when I first begin, I'm working with battens, which are my placeholders um, to separate my front strings and back strings of the warp. They start off about two to three inches wide. By the time I get to the top, I will reduce it down to about a quarter of an inch. And then once I eliminate that last batten, I will work with needles um, going string by string every other. So um, I think I was just talking about the warp. Um, if you look 
um, to the left, you can see the finished side of the um, of the, the the current weaving that I was working on. Um, can you see my mouse cursor right now? Yes, we can. Okay, so I was talking about the 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 end that I started from because it's a continuous warp which has a fixed dimension. This top edge is where I started. So when I started, this top portion was situated down here at the bottom of the loom. And as I wove higher and higher up, I it rolled to the back and got anchored on to the loom here in the back. So these are heavy, heavy, heavy duty pipes that are galvanized steel. And so I use very, very heavy pipes because again, the tension that's held by the ratchet straps that you see in the front is putting a, a, a lot of stress on those pipes. So in a smaller loom, I would use, you know, wooden dowels, but with the larger, large format textiles, it's again, um, very heavy duty process. Um, if you look at the photo to the right, here is where I'm working with about, I would say 20 strings. So each line of weaving one pass is 20 strings. So if you can imagine um, to, for me to complete one inch of weaving, it's approximately 60, um, 60 to 70 lines. So 60 to 70 lines times 20 strings, that's how, that's how much work I'm doing for just that one inch across. Um, so when I'm working, you know, I, right now I start my daily around 10 o'clock and I weave till about 6 p.m. Um, if I'm really, you know, into a piece or if I'm on like a really heavy crunch schedule, you know, I can start, you know, a few hours earlier and weave all the way, you know, till, you know, midnight or two in the morning. <laughs> it just depends on, you know, again, how quick the design is working and if I'm really um, pushing it um, to get some, some inches done. If you look at the photo to the right, you'll see that this is the heddle um, that I pull and it has a cotton string that's wound from left to right. And that string is what creates the weave pattern. And it's a plain tapestry weave. So every other string is alternated um, one in the front, one in the back. And when I pull that string, it manipulates um, the warp front and back. And my placeholder, which is my batten, it's this wooden stick right here. So again, everything's just done by hand. I pull each individual strand through by hand. And the, the wool that I'm working with right now um, is a two ply and a three ply um, Germantown wool yarn. So um, Germantown, since it came from the mills in Germantown, Pennsylvania, historically, um, it's characteristic for it to be commercially processed and plied, as well as um, dyed with chemical dyes, aniline dyes is what we call it. And that's what gives this style the signature, you know, bright, bright um, color palette is those chemical dyes. That, uh, that you can't get this color palette if you're using natural dyes. Um, especially, like I said, from the region where I'm from, it's, it's, it's not feasible to um, get this color, this kind of color wheel from our vegetation. Um, just to kind of give you some um, insights into the weaving um, design work. If you look to the left, the left photo, I have, you know, the traditional serrated diamond work. And this is one of the patterns that I grew up weaving when I was a child. And, you know, it's kind of one of those that's near and dear to my heart because um, it's always changing. Every layer, the design is progressing and with, within, you know, an, an inch, two inches, three inches, um, the design is always shifting and you're always, you know, on your toes about where um, the strings are gonna travel. So. It's a very attention grabbing and very dynamic piece visually to look at. And it's called an eye dazzler because you know, your, your eyes are dazzled when you look at it, your eyes get pulled in and it makes you know, like blurred lines and it brings you into the work um, in, a, in a very intense way with 
um, a design that's you know technically not as advanced as you would think. But again, it's it's a very fun pattern for me to weave, and so I wanted to explore the use of um, the new color palettes that <clears throat> that I that I've been working with over the past year. So this was um, a really intense um, study, you know, on the color theory, the color rainbow, just how the, the different rainbow uh, motifs were interacting with each other, not only in one scale that I started off with on that top edge, but, you know, as the scale of the serrated diamonds grew, how were the colors interacting with each other um, in terms of the white, um, the white outlining in contrast with the really, really bright um, pink background. So since that design has a lot of diagonal lines, I wanted to balance it out with more um, vertical blocky um, patterns. And that's where you see the, um, the squares to the left. Again, it's also an exploration of a lot of the new colors that I'm working with and seeing how they interact and um, move with one another and giving them, you know, these trailing tracers that are traveling and interacting with the diamonds, whether they're pushing or pulling, you know, the viewer's eye kind of wait, waits the different patterns um, into the direction that they're pulling. So um, in the photograph on the left, um, you'll see this is the back view of the, of the loom. But if you look in the distance on the far wall, there's another um, there's another loom on that wall, and um, you'll you'll also see a lot of my daughter's toys there. She spends a lot of time with me in my studio. Um, her name is Anawi Ahi, and her name translates into judge. And she's two and a half years old, so I have her there at the studio, you know, working. Um, on her playing most of the day. So it's nice to have her um, energy around in the studio. Um, but if you look past her toys, you'll see three platforms. And with these larger textiles that I weave, I'm instead of moving the weaving down with every foot that I create, I'm actually adding a platform that I sit on. So I'm increasing the height of my work area. And the reason that I do that is because one, it's a big undertaking to um, move these really heavy galvanized steel pipes. Um, so that's the first reason. The second reason is if I continually move down the woven portion of the textile, there's stress that's created on that bottom lower pipe where the textile is wrapped. And if there's too much tension at that area, it will actually bow in the weaving. And so you'll get that hourglass figure, which um, with my work, I'm, I'm trying to avoid that. So that's why I'm just adding platforms as opposed to um, moving that bowing um, motion area. So, um, in that picture, there's three platforms, but I think I've had up to seven platforms that I've sat on. So my head was pretty close to those lights up at the top of the ceiling um, by the time I was finishing the textile. So again, it's, it, it is a long process, but it's really worth it when um, you have the finished product of one of these larger textiles come off of the loom. Okay. So just to kind of give a little bit more insight into the design work, um, the weaving to the left here is my, the first weaving that I ever did when I was five years old, and it's in the collection of my mother. So the you can see that you know the color palette again it's very very muted, uh, a lot of browns and beige colors, a little bit of gray, uh, a little bit of um, some pale greens and that's pretty much the color palette that you'll see from the vegetation um, around loop and no water mesa where uh, my mother and father are from um, so this textile was woven from the scraps that my mom had left over from her weavings so 
as she was finishing up her her rugs and only had a little bit of you know colors left me and my sister um would have free reign to choose the colors out of what she had left over and so this is the first piece that I um, woven I was five years old and then as I progressed through these photos they're kind of in chronological order so you can see the progression of like you know the 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 steps that I was taking to kind of come out of a comfort zone of again doing really symmetrical work um, leaning heavily towards the um, sampler motifs so really trying to incorporate dynamic color work where you know there's a lot of intense fiery core um, work especially in this photo to the right you can see like you know it's very intense at the center of the um, serrated diamonds but then you also get a lot of that progression work of the rainbows at the top in the in the boxes and the squares so i'm trying to incorporate um you know a lot of movement and balance at the same time um one of my favorite one of my favorite materials to use in the weaving is called salt and pepper and if you look at the border um, on the piece to the right on the top and on the bottom that salt and pepper yarn which is two white strings and one black string all applied together and spun, it creates like this scrambled TV screen um, effect. And so I like to use that, you know, that contrast of the black and the white to really make a lot of the, um, again, the fiery elements pop. And it brings a lot of movement to the work as well. So this, this sampler was in 2011. So that was um, well over 10 years ago. So um, I should note that Germantown, I started my first Germantown when I was in, I believe eighth grade, around eighth grade. So, you know, it was a pivotal turning point in my design work where I was schooled in Germantown. Um, I was given a bundle of Germantown wool by um, a supplier of mine and also a book. And he said, you know, read up on it, you know, do your research and um, learn more about the background and um, here's some material. And if you, if you like it, you know, we can get you more. And so from there it was, you know, it was, I was off to a running start on Germantown. I just loved it. Okay, so here's another. Here's one of the. Let me ask, see if I can actually jump back. So <clears throat> the the photo to the left and the photo to the right are twenty. 2009 and 2011. And during this time, um, I was doing work that was heavily um, influenced by more of personal story and more of personal um, experience as opposed to um, aesthetic or design, um, design motivated work or traditional patterns. Um, this is where I kind of broke off and I was taking those traditional patterning work, the serrated diamonds, um, the crosses here, you'll see they're called spider woman crosses. Like these are all elements that, um, again, I started collaging together, but was making work that was again, following a storyline of an experience throughout my life. And so I did this full body of work, which included about seven textiles um, based on Parkinson's disease, because at that point in my life, my dad actually was diagnosed with Parkinson's. So these are all, um, all works that were within that, um, that scope. So the piece to the left is in a private collection. The piece to the right is in the collection of the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Hmm. 
And this is the final piece for that, um, for that series. And it's about six and a half feet by four and a half feet wide. So again, it's a large textile, um, heavily, heavily detailed. Um, I started on that bottom green edge, lime green edge and wove from that base up. And this one is also in a private collection. Um, I did this particular piece as like one of my first major samplers. And you can see, you know, I tried to do multiple motifs, paying attention to negative space, doing some of that black stenciling work where you see like the background design come forward. You also have a lot of the movement of, again, the spider woman crosses um, moving across the plane, but having very, very um, heavy, heavy um, line work at the top where, you know, the viewer's eye is still moving around the textile, but you do have, you know, places to rest within the work. And um, if you look at the bottom edge, you know, there's the, the beginning of the border, which is, um, again, an homage to a style that I started doing in the beginning of my career, which was the burnt water style. Which is also again a regional pattern. There's a there's a place on the Navajo res reservation called Burnt Water. Okay, so after um, <clears throat> during this time, so I graduated high school in two thousand and one. Um, after I graduated high school, um, I took a year off and then eventually went to the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and graduated in two thousand and um five so I went there initially with the intention of studying studio arts um I eventually got my associates with studio arts but eventually um took on additional coursework to get my BA in museum studies so well at the institute I actually didn't take any weaving courses until my last semester as a as a independent study but Throughout my time there at the Institute, I was taking painting courses, drawing, printmaking, um, photography, sculpture, jewelry. And I feel like, you know, all of those other mediums um, helped my own um, weaving practice at that time. And since I was in museum studies, I was actually able to, um, you know, keep weaving as my passion, but also have the opportunity to have um, a work background that was still in the art field. So still connected in a way to working with art, um, doing curatorial work, exhibitions, um, conservation it was actually what I was most interested in. And eventually I was able to intern with the museums of New Mexico, the International Folk Art Museum, and then also with the Smithsonian in, that, um, in Washington, DC with the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, specializing in textile conservation. So since, you know, I, I've always been interested in museums. Um, when I was a kid, a lot of my experiences was working with museums in the art world where I was doing the student art, mu the student art shows, the competitions that went along with the art fairs um, at the Heard Museum in Phoenix, and then also um, the Wheelwright Museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So I've always had a love for being connected with uh, museums and collections. Um, currently I do do consultation work. Um, one of the latest was with the Autry Museum, the Gene Autry Museum of the American West here in Griffith Park in Los Angeles. And then also with, again, I still have a relationship with the Heard Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. So um, that's just a little insight into some of the outreach work that, I, that I'm still doing here in Los Angeles. So another, another um, facet of work that I took on was involving text. Text and the use of the Navajo whirling log. So if you look at this work, you'll see that, you know, the, um, the text is 
one woven directly into the piece as opposed to stitched on top, um, which is like an added element of difficulty. And then also this work was again, heavily influenced by the Navajo whirling log because it was a time where um, we as native people were reclaiming a lot of our stolen and um, you know forgotten histories. And a lot of that a big facet of our history was the symbology. Um, you know, a lot of our native imagery was either banned or, you know, forcefully removed or um, was considered taboo, especially after, um, you know, World War II, a lot of tribes were steered away from using our traditional patterns like the Navajo whirling log. So um, the work that I did weaving the, and I still continue to weave, the Navajo whirling log is, you know, reclaiming again our traditional imagery, which um, predates World War II. And then in 2014, this was um, a piece that I did that was called World Traveler. And again, it was a study into um, bringing the viewer into the work, creating the three dimensional planes and actually having the viewer experience, you know, traveling the different worlds that I've woven in this set. And then this piece is with the Stark Museum in Orange, Texas, which is on the eastern edge of Texas near Louisiana. And then these are <clears throat> some smaller pieces and you know, when I'm working with the large format pieces, I like to have smaller looms with smaller works on them because, you know, when I'm working on a large piece, sometimes I only do a one inch a day. If I'm working on these smaller pieces, I can do four or five, six or, you know, even more inches a day. And it kind of just brings your um, motivation back up, being able to jump between the two looms. And with these smaller pieces, um, I do them as studies. Um, sometimes, so I'm studying either, you know, a, a color set, a colorway, or I'm exploring um, a, dif a different type of pattern. And these ones, again, just happen to be um, the eye dazzlers, which I really like. This is one of the more recent works, Undercover of Web Skies. <clears throat> I'm exploring the use of this hourglass figure, which is, um, again, a reference to Spider Woman. And within the Navajo weaving culture and our stories that revolve around um, the way weaving came about for the Navajo people, it's said that Spider Woman brought um, the, the, knowledge of Nav oh, the knowledge of weaving to the Navajo people. And Spider-Man is the one who, um, you know, brought the tools, which were, um, you know, made of the elements of the natural world. So Spider Woman, and then also, you know, the kind of reference to a black widow and the hourglass of that spider. I've, meld, I've melded those two um, references together to create this kind of like web motif um, with the link spider um, hourglasses. And again, you know, with this work, you see the kind of the contrasting of the um, the warmer tones of the pinks and the um, oranges in contrast with the you know the the upper skies, which is um, the green, green and blue. Even more recent, I've been drawn to doing large runner work. So these pieces are about 11 feet, I believe, 11 feet tall. And they've been woven on the large format, we, um, large format looms that I hear, large format looms that I have here at my studio. Um, the one, the weaving to the left is titled Walking Off No Water Mesa. And No Water Mesa is the area where my dad is from. Um, it's called No Water Mesa, Arizona, and it's pretty out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and in that area, there's a lot of sand dunes. So in the middle of that textile, you'll see 
the windows peering into a landscape of sand dunes in the distance with the spider woman crosses um, in that checkerboard purple and green sky. And then if you look to the bottom of that textile, you'll see again more of our symbology um, with the crosses and the water bugs, the arrows, and then also the whirling logs. In the motif to the right, um, it's called the Three Rivers. And this textile I wove um, throughout the pandemic. Um, and it's just the symbology of the Three Rivers is, um, you know, pre pandemic, during, and then post, but also, um, you know, as the pandemic happened, I was actually pregnant with my daughter. And so it was also um, a reflection of, you know, my life, you know, being pregnant and um, going through the changes of having, um, you know, my, my, my own family grow and being um, kind of like a steward of this knowledge and reflecting on how I'm going to pass that down to her generation and how, um, how important it is, you know, for myself to kind of foster these relationships that I, you know, was very fortunate to have growing up where I was able to, you know, again, experience weaving day to day and be able to um, provide that for my own daughter. So again, that's why I have her here at the studio with me. So it became, it becomes, you know, very um, natural and fluid for her to um, not only see the weaving and see myself weaving and hear the sounds of the loom and feel the materials, um, but also make it accessible and attainable for her to continue the tradition if she um, chooses to do so. And I think that's the end of the slides that I have here. Um, again, I'm working on large format pieces right now. I have two, two solo shows um, coming up, one at the end of this year, um, another at the beginning of next year, and then um, a smaller sh third solo show in New York City. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm very fortunate that I, that you know, I have the space to work here in um, Long Beach, but I'm very fortunate that um, I've been able to, you know, garner a lot of notoriety throughout my career. And, you know, a lot of that is owed to, um, you know, my mother, my mother Lola, my aunts, and, you know, my grandmothers, and also, you know, the extended family that I've um, acquired in the weaving community. Um, through the other weavers who have seen, you know, my work progress, you know, from being a child and then, you know, into the place that I am now. Um, I usually get a question of, you know, what does my grandmother think about it? And she's, you know, one of my number one supporters in making sure that, you know, the work that I create is reflective of me as a, you know, independent <clears throat> Navajo woman, but also um, they've seen my work flourish from, you know, a foundation of respect and tradition and, uh, and a foundation of wanting to absorb knowledge and be able to house this knowledge for future generations to come. So that's a very, very um, important part of, you know, my weaving, my weaving career is being able to um, share the knowledge that I have with up and coming weavers and anybody who else, anybody else who wants to, um, you know, understand this, this practice. So I'll leave you all with that right now, but, you know, I'm open to any questions that anyone has that I can field. Hey, Melissa, you have a ton. Our audience is super engaged and curious and um, they're just like loving what you're sharing. Um, there is one person who is asking, Vanessa, um, can you talk about the processing of wool for weaving, um, including carding, spindle spinning, and other hand processing techniques prior to weaving? Um, yeah, I actually, like I said, I learned, I learned kind of like opposite from my mom. She, she learned by going out and herding the sheep, and then they would, you know, before the summer started, they would shear the sheep and process and clean card the wool, spin the wool. And that's all the work that the kids did. <laughs> you know, it was kind of like grunt work at that point. 
um, because it's labor intensive. You know, the wool is smelly and stinky, you get dirty, and it's just really, really hard work. Um, the way that I learned was, you know, I had already had commercially processed wool. My mom sat me down and was like, you know, this is how you do A, B, C, and D. And I didn't learn the material process and probably till, until middle school to high school. So um, I did grow up, you know, herding sheep. Um, my mother, you know, has always had her flock of sheep. And she currently has about, I would say about 60 head of churro sheep. And so the work that she creates. So if you look at the, the pieces that are up right now that I'm showing on the slide, these are nine nine and a half foot pieces, 10 foot pieces, 11 foot pieces. She works up to 14 and a half, 15 feet by eight and a half feet wide. Amazing. So yeah, so her, <laughs> her textile work is massive compared to um, what I do in terms of these large runners. Um, the difference is that she doesn't use any dyes in her work. So she actually harvests the raw material from her own flock cleans it, spins it, and then weaves it. So her, you know, her labor intensive process is actually years before she even begins to do the, the woven textile. So, so it's, it's very, very long for her. Um, but again, her style is what fulfills her as a weaver where I don't have that patience to, <laughs> to work in that, in that arena. And, you know, again, my work is very, very color driven. So this is what, you know, myself as a weaver is my signature style. But, um, but yes, the, the material prep and the dyeing and the spinning and that process is very, very labor intensive. And it takes a lot of time to actually um, master that even, even, you know, me as a, you know, a long life weaver you know, it's, it's still very, very difficult. Thank you, Melissa. And mm -hmm. speaking of sheep, uh, Janice, uh, Janice, yeah, would, uh, would like to know what type of sheep were raised or is raised by your family. And, um, did you purchase other types of sheep? Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> My mom, um, her whole flock is churro. So churro is, um, it's highly regarded. Um, one, because the fibers are very long and um, in, in the run of run of the mill, like Navajo sheep, their fleece is very short, but the churro, they grow long and fluffy and the fibers are very soft. So it's nice texture to weave with because it's easier on the hands. And it also has like a fairly high lanolin content. So again, it, it makes your hands feel um, moisturized when you're working with it. Whereas if you have materials like the Germantown wool, it's more abrasive because of the chemical process and the machine manufacturing. It takes, it strips the lanolin from the fiber. So because it has a lower oil lanolin content, it's less attractive to pests. So you'll see less, um, you'll see less like moth damage to these um, very, very bright lan um, aniline dyed works as opposed to natural colors um, or that are processed less because they have more of that attraction to the lanolin, which they'll feed on. <laughs> oh, so interesting to learn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have more questions. Um, someone wants to know if uh, there are any weaving communities to join in Long Beach or South, South Bay, LA area. Um, I'm not too sure, actually. Um, I'm kind of here in my studio, which is, you know, can be can become very cavernous, cavernous at times because I'm I work such long hours. But um, I do do weaving workshops um, here and there, which is usually in conjunction with one of the um, museums. And I know that I'm going to be doing one weaving workshop next year, which is partnered with the Autry Museum. So you can, if anybody's interested in that, I know yet you can keep an eye out for their listing and posting at some point next year. Uh, we've been sharing, oh no, no, we, we did share that. And hopefully um, once we get some information, we'll be sharing it on our um, 
our page as well, like either the our ARC Facebook page, um, if you guys are, are on um, Facebook. Uh, our next question is, um, how much, from Albert, how much advanced planning goes into the textiles? Which you mentioned uh, a little bit. So the main planning that I do is the shape. You know, do I want to work in a large runner, a long runner, or do I want to do something that's a little bit more like a classical, classic style, which would be like this dimension of, you know, like a two by three ratio. Um, I'm really drawn to the runners currently because I like how as it's moving like a scroll, so the, the design can change quickly and I can kind of um, cycle through a lot of ideas quicker because I'm not weaving in a very wide um, plane. Um, let's go back to the loom. Yeah, so if you look at the loom here on the right hand side, um, I do have to take the loom into consideration because I can weave a textile that's taller than the loom because I can fold it down below or I can fold it over the top, but I can't weave a textile that's wider. So the width of the frame is, it, it, it determines how wide I have to work with. So um, th that's dimension. In terms of design work, I usually have an idea of where like bold elements are gonna go, like bold shapes. With this pink piece, I knew that they were gonna work at a diagonal kind of following one another, the two different left and right hand panels. And then the top was gonna to be capped off with um, another kind of heavy, heavy, darker feel. Um, so I kind of have like those elements, but um, what I do when I sit down is I actually count the strings. So if you look to the right hand side of this photo, I actually count each individual string and then I mark where my middle line of symmetry is gonna be. And then from there, I offset lines of symmetry. I add lines of symmetry. I um, use geometry like for everything. I pretty much map out in my head um, in a grid-like format of where these elements are gonna be. And everything has to be precise down to the string. Otherwise the design will get thrown off. And every, every, every string is accounted for. And I don't draw anything out. So there's no, there's no cartouches, there's no, um, there's no drawings that I work off of. Everything is in my head, all the math. That's, that's crazy. And I'm sure all the math teachers or math lovers <laughs> here are super excited, but that's insane. Um, and that's why weaving is an art. And um, I can definitely say it's a science um, with all that process and like math included. So thank you for sharing that. And yeah. Speaking, I mean Oh, just one thing, like, you know, I like to, <clears throat> to, you know, really bring that up, especially when I'm doing like workshops or classes with younger kids, um, because, you know, they always say, when am I going to ever use geometry or math in the real world? And, you know, my whole career revolves around <laughs> geometry and math. So it's funny to bring that up. Thank you. Um, this is, a uh, again, re regarding, um, I guess, the, the loom or the tension. One of them would like to know what was the extra high tension for? I think this is during your talk. Um, um, is it then a tighter weave when the tension is released? Um, yes. So the the tensioning of the warp um, it makes your sides very very straight. If you have a, sh a tighter tension, if your tension is loose, what happens is your vertical white inner structure warp strings begin, begin to shift left and right. And so when your strings start to shift, they start to bunch. And in those bunched up se sections, you get lumps in the weaving. So you get a very, very uneven, like wavy look. And so having a tighter tension avoids that from happening. Um, and again, it also gives you the ability to compact your horizontal weft, um, the colored strings, you, you're able to compact those a lot tighter. So when you do release the textile from the rug, from the loom, it's already kind of, I wouldn't say collapsed in on itself, but the, everything is so tightly held into place that it gives a more stable, stronger textile weave. 
And, you know, a lot of times you'll hear like collectors or gallerists say, you know, this textile is like 60 wefts per inch or it's a hundred wefts per inch. And the higher number um, the weft count is, the more valuable it's perceived to be because there's more lines per inch, which means more work per inch, meaning that it's a tighter weave. So that's, that's another reason why you want your tension higher is because it's just, you, you, can, you can compact more design and detail into the piece. Thank you for that. Um, another person wants to know if your studio is open for visitors, and if so, uh, where is your studio, which you <laughs> mentioned. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Long Beach right now. It's actually a closed studio right now, unless I'm like doing a, a program where there's like a, a group. I mean, I'm, 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 op I'm open to that, but I don't have anything um, scheduled or anything like that right now. It's usually um, just museum entities or professionals who come in for um, consultations and things like that. Um, another person wants to know, um, and I, you mentioned it earlier too, that um, are you planning to pass this art into the, the next generation, to the younger generation? Yeah, I mean, I like to, I like having my daughter here. Um, again, she's only two and a half right now, but, you know, I started weaving out with, at five. So just having her around and her energy here is really invigorating to me because, um, you know, I want her to learn, you know, on a foundational level where she at least um, can have the appreciation for the art form. But, you know, when I grew up, I wasn't forced to weave. It was always exciting for me to be able to learn because I saw my sister weaving and I saw my aunts and it was just like exciting because I wanted to be part of that group. And I'm hoping, you know, that she's, you know, feels the same way and has that same kind of drive and excitement to, you know, be part of, you know, this Navajo weaving tradition as well. But, um, you know, again, I just wanted to make it accessible for her and let her know that, you know, any fostering that I can do and guiding her down that path, you know, I'm available. That's beautiful. I love that, you know, you grew up with weaving and you saw your family members and um, now you're providing the same for your daughter. So like, that's amazing. So hopefully in the next few years on the road, we'll see her work somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, she actually um, will sit next to me and, and just play with her toys as I'm working. And um, I'm actually eight months pregnant right now. <laughs> so I'll have my, I'll have my son, um, you know, here next month and um just having him be able to um experience you know the sounds of the weaving which i'm sure he can hear <laughs> you know the tapping at the loom and just be able to you know again dive into um a world that's saturated with the culture of it um i'm i'm very happy that i'm able to provide that and i'm actually really fortunate that i'm able to provide that for them um you know when I, when I grew up weaving, it was, you know, was being considered a dying art. And I, that's where I really wanted to reverse that mentality and that thinking by, by bringing in that Germantown revival style, which was also, you know, a time when Navajo weaving was considered, you know, a dying art with the, um, with the, the imprisonment at Bosque Redondo and us losing, you know, so many people with, from the tribe, you know, it was a time for reinvigoration of, of retaining this knowledge. And, of, you know, I, in a sense, I kind of felt, in, you know, a tiny inkling of that, you know, growing up where it's like, you know, we were losing our language, we were losing our elders, we were losing, you know, all of these different facets of our culture um, slowly. But, you know, me being able to be a steward of this knowledge, I want to be able to reverse that. Yeah, we totally see it. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so many people who, uh, at least in this webinar, uh, there's about like over 115 that's uh, signed in. Um, you know, we definitely want to support your work. And hopefully this, this will definitely get people more connected. And uh, we're just, I think, blown away by what you're telling us and just uh, the amount of work and dedication that's going into, into like your art. Um, and uh, on to our next question. Again, lots more questions. <laughs> um, let's see. 
I think someone wanted to know where you can get uh, Germantown wool. Um, that's a hard question because uh, <laughs> actually <laughs> the supplier that I had, I they ended up closing shop about, let's see, maybe about seven or eight years ago. And so the supplier that I had pretty much sold out of everything that, that they um, made. But you can you can still you know source from different mills um, in the Germantown area. Um, they're in Pennsylvania. I know that there's some in Delaware and New Hampshire, Connecticut. There's a there's a strong weaving culture in New England. So you'll 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 definitely be able to find um, uh, materials that are very very similar to what um, to the Germantown feel. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's pronounced Malane. Uh, Malane would like to know, uh, one, given a, uh, given a prospect takes six months or more, do you engage in other activities or uh, finances? Is it too personal a question? Uh, if not, that's fine. Uh, and then you mentioned your mom gave you specific instructions for weaving. Do you know why she did this versus using the more traditional ways you mentioned? Um, <clears throat> So I think the, the, the way that I learned how to weave was based on my mother learned out of necessity. So they learned out of, um, you know, the reason why they sheared the sheep and created the textiles that they did was, was because one, it was for utilitarian purposes. It was just, you know, they use blankets in the household there were saddle blankets on their horses. They wove um, to put food on the table to take to the trading post. Um, they used them, you know, with as you know, wall floor coverings. So it, it was a very different mentality of why they were weaving. Um, it was to again, she she had you know, thirteen brothers and sisters. It was to provide food for her siblings as being one of the elder um, children in the family. Um, whereas I learned it was art. It was something that I did on my off time for, you know, the summer or when I got home from school or on the weekends. So it was more of a leisurely thing and not a necessity for me to weave. Um, so there was definitely a different mentality uh, behind the purpose of it. Um, you know, my mom grew up in the boarding school and assimilation era. So the idea of of retaining cultural knowledge was not a priority. So when it came time for me to weave, it was more of like, I want you to learn and to be able to absorb this information. So I think that's why it was more of a formal teaching for me as opposed to just, you know, you'll you'll learn, you'll pick it up because you know you're around it all the time. I wasn't around it all the time in terms of working with the sheep and shirt and and in terms of like um, um, being with the flock all day, that, well, that's what your job was. You, you were just a sheep herder day in, day out. Whereas I went to school, I lived in Austin, Texas for a minute. I lived in Oceanside, California and went to, you know, rural or uh, urban public schools. So it, again, it's just a very, very black and white upbringing um, from what my mother experienced. And that was reflected in the way that I was taught. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, it, it just goes to show like the histories and the events that happen around you definitely affect, uh, affects and, you know, uh, just how cultural traditions are are done. So that's definitely reflected here. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, um, yeah. And, um, an interesting fact about that too is, you know, my dad had, you know, a number of siblings, um, you know, 15 siblings growing up, but a few of his sisters actually ended up here in Riverside at the Sherman Indian School, um, at the boarding school there. So, you know, it, again, it was a time when retaining cultural knowledge um, wasn't a priority. It was, you know, kill the Indian, save the man mentality. Um, so the fact that I was able to have two parents who, you know, fostered this art form at such a young age, you know, being in the early 80s, you know, I was, I'm very lucky to be able to have the long career that I do have. 
I'm sure you're going to have a super long career that we can all support. <laughs> um, going back to some of your designs, um, someone wanted to know um, why are um, Spider Woman Spider Woman crosses called Spider Woman crosses? Um, I think it's just you know a stylistic um, term that that has been adopted over the years. <clears throat> if you look at the crosses, let's see. Well, one thing about the cross is that, you know, it has four arms and within Navajo culture, the number four is like one of our important sacred numbers and, you know, multiples of four um, representing, you know, the four sacred mountains, the four sacred directions. Um, and when I say four sacred mountains, the Navajo, our traditional homelands are within the four sacred mountains. Um, in Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado, not Colorado, um, Utah. Um, if you look on the textile to the left here, you can see all the symbols that I have stenciled on that lower portion of the weaving. They all have, you know, that symmetry of four. So it's a reference to balance. It's, if you look at the Navajo whirling log and the four arms there, it's spinning in, a clockwise manner, which is opposite of, you know, the, the Nazi swastika, but it spins in that clockwise manner, which is, which is representative of like the natural direction of the world. So it's, it's re representative of, you know, life progressing on. And um, that's why there's a lot of um, heavy influence of that number four and the spider woman. Thank you. Uh, and then a lot of people want to know, where are your other two shows going to be at? Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> one just got announced, which is I'm going to be part of um, a group show, which is the Made in LA show. That's going to be this year. But I have two solo shows, which I haven't um, announced yet, but it, it's coming soon. I, I'm going to be able to talk a little bit more in depth about them um, cool. very soon. And then um, if people do want to know, uh, where where the, can they find um, this information? Do you have a, like a, a page that they can go to? Or I'm currently represented by Garth Greenan, G-R-E-E-N-A-N -E -E Gallery, which is in Chelsea in New York City. Um, that's going to be the third smaller solo show that's going to happen after the two major um, solo exhibitions. But um, they do like um, an email update blast pretty frequently and they'll give updates on my um, upcoming exhibitions there as well as posting um, on their website. Um, I do have social media. I don't post too often, but the major things like this, I will post updates. And Instagram, um, my handle is Cody Edgewater and um, Facebook is just my name. Thank you. Um we won't be able to get through all these questions, <laughs> but maybe we can do uh, one or two more. Sure. Um, let's see. Oh, this is interesting. Is weaving strictly for women only or do men do weaving also? No, it's um, traditionally it was predominantly women. I wouldn't say it was always women, but it was predominantly women. Again, um, the, the traditions, you know, traditions and like the rules behind tradition have, you know, have grown and have um, been changed throughout the course of, you know, generations. So, you know, even with the patterning of the Navajo textile, you know, what was considered tradition a um, hundred years ago has, you know, has changed and we're creating new traditions today. You know, what I'm weaving now, you know, 50 years from now will be the, the the next tradition. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of male weavers. Um, actually, when I was growing up, my cousin, um, he's his aunt, who's my my um, or his mom, who's my aunt, is Navajo, but his dad is Hopi, and within the Hopi tribe, it's the men who are the weavers. So he grew up weaving alongside me, and then also my brother learned how to weave as well. Um, my mom wanted him to have an appreciation for 
um, what we as the women of the family were doing. And so he wove about five, six, five or six pieces, you know, um, before he graduated high school. So there are male weavers. And I think um, today you'll see a, um, a heavy influence on two-spirited weavers. So those who identify as both male and female. And, you know, within a lot of indigenous cultures, it's very special to be, you know, a two-spirit person because you can walk both both sides of um, the male and female existence. So it's, you know, it's highly coveted in that way. But um, so, yeah, you'll see, you'll see a lot of male and female weavers. And uh, I feel like within the last 15 years, there's been a real, real, um, <clears throat> there's been a real influx of um, younger weavers because, again, there was so there were so many definitions of you know what a Navajo weaver was or what a Navajo Navajo weaving you know um, had to be and all of those definitions and restrictions were put into place by outside entities by third parties and within the last again 10 15 years we as Navajo people have really taken upon ourselves to define what we considered our own traditions and our own ways of um, progressing with our artistic, you know, knowledge and culture. So um, the newer generation of weavers are, you know, forging their own paths and creating work that's, um, again, more reflective and um, storytelling of the current generation, which is great, which is, you know, exactly where um, I think it needs to go. I and, you know, again, it's taking, it's taking, um, our own knowledge and being able to tell our own stories. And a lot of that, you know, is not only on an individual level, but it's also bringing those conversations into um, platforms like within the museum um, atmosphere, you know, being able to write our own books, being able to write our own labels, being able to identify ourselves and being able to speak for ourselves and not have somebody tell our histories for us. So that, that's an exciting time that we're in right now. I love that. I hope that, um, you know, this is just a little part of, of that little, or not that huge undertaking of, of sharing your <laughs> culture. And um, it sounds like there's going to be a lot of things that we can definitely look forward to, new exciting things. So, mm -hmm. um, but I do want to say thank you. Um, there's so many of our, our audience members who are just saying thank you for, um, you know, sharing your culture, your stories, and your art. Um, they've all been amazed by it. And um, I don't know if you have any last minute uh, comments to the audience before we close out. Um, no, I'm just really happy that I'm able to share. Again, you know, I, I actually grew up a little bit um, near Oceanside when I was a about kindergarten age. So being able to kind of come back to Southern California and be based here and being able to create and kind of feed off the energy of um, LA County and being here in Long Beach, it's it's really amazing to see kind of everything come full circle. And it's exciting to be again in this atmosphere of, um, of being able to share, you know, my cultural heritage, heritage and knowledge with, um, you know, not only weavers and indigenous people, but, you know, with the community that I'm now rooted in. And so it's, it's, I'm happy that I was, you know, invited out and I want to say thank you for having me. Well, we're always uh, happy to have you back. So maybe we can have you again um, when, when you're less busy, but uh, anytime you want to come back, please let us know. Uh, this has been a blast and our audience is uh, gloving in. Um, I just want to say thank you again on behalf of uh, the American Indian Resource Center, LA County Library, and our audience. Uh, and happy Mother's Day to Melissa, to all those who are listening to us. Um, may you have a wonderful day. And yes, this, will, this video will be uh, shared on our um, library uh, YouTube. So um, thank you again and have a wonderful day, guys.